Hello guys. So this is my school aged child. My preschool age child. I mean preschool age. Now she is one of our life cast dolls which means that she was um, made from a real life person and she is an amazing um, doll um, to do some of our um, simulations with uh, because there's a few things about her that is very uh, lifelike. First thing, her size. So I'm going to pick her up so that you guys can see her. Ugh. Here she is. Now look at how big she is in comparison to me and my body. She's a preschooler. She's a preschooler and y'all, she weighs like a preschooler, which is why I'm having to hold her like this. She's very, very real in weight, okay? Also, um, she has a couple of things um, wrong with her. Um, so she uh, has a skint up knee. She has been crying. You can tell she's been crying. Um, and we can use her for a lot of different other simulations um, for clean labs and things like that uh, because of her age category. So I wanted to bring her out. Now she got more hair child than any preschooler. I kind of know, but I wanted to bring her out during this lecture so that you guys can see, you know, what I'm stating when talking about the preschool age child. All right, now these little preschoolers, honey, they are really something. They are learning very, very fast. Some things they learn is great. But some things they learn not so great okay um, so let's go ahead and let's talk about the preschooler so let's start I'm gonna scoot back here so let's start this is chapter 18 the le preschooler okay that's how you say preschool fancy the le preschooler is who we're going to be talking about, okay? Now, there's some general general characteristics when we're dealing with the preschooler. The preschooler is from three to five years of age. They are marked by slowing of physical growth. They are also mastering and refining of motor skills, social skills, and some cognitive abilities. Now, let's talk a little bit about how a preschool appearance may differ from a toddler. They're going to be bigger than a toddler. Um, they are going to be able to have a little bit more cognitive abilities than a toddler, okay? Um, you will start noticing that they are getting taller. You will start noticing that they are getting stronger, okay? Uh, now, in what ways has a preschool child differs, uh, refines his or her motor, social, and cognitive, and uh, those skills compared to a toddler. Well, toddlers don't do, they do a lot of parallel play. Uh, preschoolers do a lot of group together play, okay? Also, now that's for social. Now their motor skills, you know, toddlers, they're trying to learn and grasp this like fine motor skills of picking things up, moving things from place to place. These preschoolers, honey, they got that down, okay? They they are picking up things. They are seeing things that you, you know, child, you would have never seen it. And their thought process is a little bit more broad. So cognitive, they have a little bit more going on. Now, there's a major task that we are um, dealing with when it comes to a preschool age child, like preparation for uh, them to enter school. It is super important that we are teaching the preschooler things that's going to benefit them for when they're going into school. So we're trying to prep them for school with things like, you know, teaching them their name, how to spell their name, um, teaching them little skills like tying their shoes, things like that. 
um, how to count, how to say their ABCs. Those things we don't really wait till they get into school age. These are things that we're prepping them at preschool age. Then we have the development of cooperative type of play. Like I said, they, they can do parallel play, but they're more into doing group and together play. And we're teaching them how to cooperate with each other. So for example, I love, love, love them little kitchen sets that you see in preschool. All my daughters had one. <laughs> Everybody had one. Um, but I like that it gives them the event to learn how to play cooperatively. So they'll one of them will be in the little kitchen set doing something and then another one in the same kitchen set doing something and they are cooperatively playing together. Then we have control of bodily functions. By the time they are preschool age, this is when we expect for them to be potty trained, all right? They know how to ask to go to the restroom. Um, they may be able to, you know, give you notice that they have to go. So in case they have to hold it for a slight minute for you to get them to the restroom. They, uh, they have some uh, acceptance of separation, which means that they understand mommy's going to go to work, I am going to go to school, and then mommy's going to come pick me up or daddy, whoever. They have increased communication skills. These people can talk. These people got a lot to talk back. We might not always understand what's important about what they're talking about, but we like to hold conversations with them anyway because it helps them grow their communication skills. They have a good memory and their attention span is longer than when they were toddlers, okay? Now they have some um, physical development things also. Um, by the age of five, they should have doubled their one-year-old weight. So their one-year-old weight should be doubled by the age of five. Now, between the ages of three and six years old, they're going to be growing taller and they may lose some of that like chubbiness that you will see these toddlers have, like that, that little roundness, the little chubby, like they're going to lose some of that, not all, but they will lose some of that by preschool age. All 20 of their primary teeth have erupted, which is why it's super important that they have uh, dental visits. Um, they have good control of muscles, like we were talking about. Um, they can run and stop on a dime. Child, they can do a lot of things. That's a huge difference from toddler to preschool. They uh, hand preference develops by three years of age. So we're going to know if this child is going to write with their right hand or if they're going to write with their left hand by that time. Uh, they're going to have a preference, and you'll see that by the hand that they start picking up things with, the hand that they decide that they want to color with, and things like that by the age of three. They may have more adapt of at using old skills as each year passes. Now, let's talk about the Piaget cognitive development when it comes to the preschool child. They will have pre-operational phase. That's between two and four years old, the pre-operational stage. Then we have the intuitive thought. The intuitive thought is between five and seven years of age, okay? Now, there was a very good example. Let me see if I can find it for you real quick. Just stick with me, guys. You'll appreciate it. Stick with me for a minute. Y'all know I'm about to have to stick these glasses on my head. On my face, child. Let's see here. Y'all y'all see me fooling around for them glasses. Now, why y'all didn't tell me them glasses was not on my head? Here we go. Girl, and these are so dirty. How you gonna see out of them? Okay, let's try it again. Here we go. Let's go into chapter 18. Hold on.
That whole timing a timeout thing just throws me, honey. Just throws me. Okay, here we go. So, when we're talking about the intuitive stage, the intuitive stage is one of pre-logical thinking. The experience and logic are based on outside appearance. The child does not understand that a wide glass and a tall glass can both contain the same amount of fluid in it. A distinctive characteristic of intuitive thinking is centering. The, uh, the tendency to concentrate on a single outstanding characteristic of an object while excluding its other features. That right there is one of the biggest things that I need you guys to remember when we're talking about intuitive stages, okay? Intuitive stages, they're intuitive thought. Now let's talk about the effects of cultural practices. Now the effects of cultural practices can influence the development of a sense of uh, initiative. All right, parents and older siblings will model language development. And let's talk about uh, examples of how culture affects the sense, of, the sense of initiative. So culturally, if the um, little girl, let's stay with the little girl, because she's a little girl. If the little girl sees things that culturally they see the women do, um, they're going to take initiative to do those kind of things. I always say, um, I know it's very primitive. I know it's very primitive. And we, we don't all live in that bubble. I'm just using an example. So please just follow along. If um, a preschooler sees her mother, her sister, her aunt, her whatever, uh, dealing with children most of the time, a lot of the time, they're going to take that initiative to do it as well. Okay, that's all that is saying. Now, how is a preschooler child's language development affected by those in their family? I could tell you because I've experienced it. My family is from Louisiana, okay? I was not born in Louisiana. I was born in the good old Dallas, Texas, okay? But in my family, um, we speak a lot of... Um, a lot of Creole like terms, which is basically French words, you know, with a slight uh, connection of African lingo, right? So I, in my family, as a young child, I heard uh, French all the time, right? And so I didn't know that I was bilingual at the time when we were doing it or I was around it so often with the older adults in our family. Uh, but because both of those languages were spoken around me all the time, I not only understood them both, but then I could speak them both, okay? Um, same thing with some children who may uh, have other languages spoke, spoken in their home. Um, I have a really good friend. Her name is Cynthia, and she grew up in a house where they spoke English and Spanish, right? And so she as well said she didn't understand that that was called being bilingual at that time she was a preschooler a toddler her whole life she just heard both languages and so she spoke both languages and she had a switch like she was able to speak them both at the same time a lot of time depending on who in fact she was speaking to right then um so that's how that comes into play for them now let's talk about language development. Now there could be delays or problems that can be caused by things like uh, psychological, uh, physiological, or environmental stressors. These things can all have a hand in the delay or problems with their language development. Now this includes both the understanding of the language and the expression of the language. So some may say, like how do environmental stressors 
make that happen. Well, any stressor can cause something. So if they're having environmental stressors or at home, there are stressors where they cannot um, get their point across or they're not being, being spoken to. This would make them have these developmental errors or developmental delays. Now let's talk about bedtime habits. These people do not believe they have a bedtime. These people believe that they can stay up and watch Netflix with you. Okay, that's not so. That's not so, little Sally. So uh, there should be some bedtime habits formed. So we must engage the child in quiet activities before it's bedtime, like wind down time. All right, establish and maintain very specific rituals that signal that we are getting ready for bedtime. So some people will do things like dim the lights. Some people will do things like put on soothing music. Some people will do things like, you know, making sure that there's the bath and like there's the dinner and then there's the bath and then there's the reading of the book. You know what I'm saying? Like a ritual and the ritual has to happen the same time every time in order for it to become a habit for the child. Now, let me tell you where some people get it mistake. Some people get it twisted when they say, oh, our child won't go to bed or our child won't adhere to the routine. Number one, it takes time. Number two, you, the, the authority figure, have to do it the same way every time, no matter what. You are the one forming the habit. So are the parent is the one that you're teaching about them forming the habit. So if the child does not have the habit or it's a, part, it's a stressor every night to keep putting little Sally back in her bed every night and she's screaming and then it's chaos in the home, there's one or two things. Either you just need to be patient and continue forming the habit and they will get the hang of it, or you have to teach yourself that you have to continue to do it the same way every time to assist little Sally into getting the habit, okay? Now, there are some attention-getting behaviors that result in the child uh, getting into the parent's bed that should be discouraged, all right? Uh, reward the attention-getting behavior and def this defeats the objectives of the bedtime ritual, which means, in very, very plain language, the behavior can be something like, um, little Sally keeps telling you that um, she wants a drink of water. Okay? She wants a drink of water. She comes to, the bed, to your bed. I want a drink of water. You get up. You give her a drink of water. You take her back to her bed. Uh, 15 minutes later, here she comes. She wants a drink of water. That behavior lets her know that she can continue to do it because you will continue on with her. Or another attention getting behavior for them to get into the bed with you. You know, maybe some things like they tell you they're, they don't like the dark or they're scared of the dark or, you know, they want the dog or they want the this or want the that and they just want to come climb in your bed. Okay, well, after a while, a lot of times they can wear the parent down. Right, so then you just go on with the attention getting behavior, and then you wonder why when they're five, they're still in your bed. Well, it's because the attention getting behavior worked and they weren't taught another behavior, okay, that they could still be very comfortable in their own bed or that you can help soothe them to help them get back to sleep in their own bed before you then go to your own bed, these type of things. Then we have the physical, mental, emotional, and social development. These things happen at different times, and they are all different. So we have it for the three-year-old child, the four-year-old child, and the five-year-old child. Now these physical, um, yeah, these physical, mental, uh, emotional, and social development. I really like. Um, Tell me two. Three, four, five. There's some um, thoughts on that on table 18-1. So go to that 18-1 uh, table where you guys will be able to see that a little bit plainly. Then also on page 434, there is a portion here that has it aimed out in the different age groups, okay? Please pay 
close attention to that. It ages them all out, okay? Now let's move on to some guidance, guidance for discipline and limit settings. So children need limits for their behaviors, okay? They need limits and not so much no, 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 but to understand what their limits are. We must teach and gradually shift control from parents' control to the child's control. So that's why it's important that we teach them the limits so they will know what is okay for them to do and what is not okay for them to do instead of not being able to understand that, make that judgment for themselves. Uh, Self-discipline or self-control is gained by understanding that they have uh, limits, okay? They have limits that they can go into. Now, there's a thing of timing the timeout. Now, we have always stated and always say that there's one minute per year of age that you're supposed to have no contact, no eye uh, contact, no interaction with little Sally when you put her in timeout. Now... Some kids have time out. Some kids have, your time is up. <laughs> um, some people believe in time out and some don't. That is just, everybody has their own preference. Uh, we can't force time out on parents, uh, but we can express to them that they could use the method of what that is in a different manner, all right? The limits make children feel secure, uh, we protect them from danger and relieve them from decisions that they are too young to make, which is why a lot of parents need to do all of the discipline and um, showing them where the guidelines are. If they don't know where the guidelines are, they could be, it could become a safety problem. It could turn into an emotional issue. They could really put themselves into danger, okay? Now, Let's talk about how limits make the child feel secure. They know what's okay. If you know what's okay and you know what's not, then you feel secure in what you're doing. All right? That's just the bottom line of it. Um, let's talk about how limits and self-discipline differ from each other and the parent's role in each. Now, when we are giving them limits, we're teaching them self-discipline because they're the ones that have to stay within their limits. The child, the child has to stay within their limits. Then we have a thing of reward, okay? Now, we need to not confuse rewards with bribes, okay? Bri little Jimmy, little Sally, okay? If you, if you don't cut up in this grocery store, now, I'm going to give you a bag of chips. That's a bribe, okay? That's a bribe. Let me tell you what the reward is. Sally, you did so well in the grocery store today. Here's a here's your treat for doing so well today. That right there is a reward. Y'all see the difference? All right. Now, consistency and modeling significantly influences the behavior. So, if little Sally here know, oh, shoot, I got a new dolly when I went to the store with mama because I was good all day. I stayed within my limits. I I didn't cut up. I was so good and mama was so proud, okay? Then little Sally here knows her limits and knows what to do. And then she knows that if she continues to be correct and practice within her limits, there's a good chance that she will get a reward, all right? Now, let's move on to preschool age children and jealousy. It's a thing, all right? Now, there is a normal response to actual, supposed, or threatened loss of attention. Jealousy of a new sibling, um, strongest in children younger than the age of five, this may revert to behaviors seen at earlier stages and ages. This may be, a, they may have some aggression. They may bite. They may pinch. This tends to be seen less 
and an only child, because like who are they gonna be jealous of? And children should feel they are helping with the care of the sibling, then that decreases the jealousy. So let's talk about it. Now, jealousy is real, but they don't know it's jealousy. And what is not a great thing to do that we want to educate the families and the um, parents about or anybody who's caring for the child is to kind of not make those type of observations to the child. You know, like, oh, they're so jealous of the baby. You mad because the baby got stuff? That doesn't do anything but fuel their little fire because they don't understand what's going on. Okay, because they just see that everybody is coming and paying attention to this baby. And so they have, they're threatened with their loss of affection. So that is why there's this whole new trend, you know, here, like, I don't know, the last 10 years or so, when people have been saying, hey, if you bring um, a gift for the baby, do you mind bringing a little trinket or a little something for their older sibling? Uh, because they like to feel um, included. And that's all it is, making them feel included included and what's going on now normally it's children that are younger than five because of course they have no understanding of what's going on which is why they behave that way another reason that they revert to behaviors that's seen in earlier ages is because sometimes the thought process is is that's what this baby is doing I'll do it and I'll get affection or they do those kind of things and then they get extra attention because now you the parent now and any attention is some attention even if it's not the good attention now you're focusing in on them um, if they decide to um, go back to talking like a baby and they were talking normally or if they uh, re uh, regress and they start uh, having potty accidents okay all throughout the day and they were completely potty trained all right Now let's talk about thumb sucking. Thumb sucking is um, instinctual behavior. Uh, fingers or thumb sucking will not have a detrimental effect on their teeth as long as the habit is discontinued before the permanent teeth erupt. And a child who is trying to stop thumb sucking is given praise and encouragement, okay? This may uh, regress, though, during periods of stress or fatigue. They may go back to it. So, what do I like to say? Let's talk about it. So, um, babies, even in the wound, <laughs> we have pictures of them thumb sucking or, or putting their fingers in their mouth. Um, it's very um, instinctual, all right? But what we will notice is, is that when they become preschoolers, they may still do it, all right? They may still do it. It's not going to give them a huge problem unless their permanent teeth are coming in and they're still doing it. Um, so we do want to uh, try to get new behaviors or praise them for not doing it, but then we don't uh, punish them for during times of stress or when they're tired if they reverse to it. A lot of times we have learned that we would just distract or give them something else to do, um, and then that activity will limit itself until it does um, go away. I do know that some people do these real dramatic things, you know, they will, you know, put nasty stuff on their thumbs or whatever like that to keep them from um, sucking their thumbs uh, or whatever. And in some instances it worked and in some instances it does not. All right. Oh, but I want to say one thing. Let me go backwards just a little bit. When I was talking about the jealousy of the preschool child, let me place a pin in that and say this one thing what we have noticed and there's plenty of studies that show that if you give the preschooler a job to do for the baby then now they get to be the boss of something and they don't have much jealousy about it because then they are you know looked upon as the big helper they're looked upon as someone who's needed and it gives them a role and they they do very well with that okay let's go ahead and move on so now I want to talk about bedwetting. Bedwetting is considered uh, enuresis, okay? Enuresis is bedwetting. Now there's several layers. We have the primary and the secondary, okay? Now to start out, 
enuresis is more common in boys than in girls, all right? The primary is that the child has never been dry, okay? That's primary enuresis, all right? Then we have secondary, secondary enuresis, and this is bedwetting that re, uh, recurrences in a child who has been dry for periods of one year or more. So primary um, enuresis is a child who just does not have the the sense of being able to not wet during the night or not wet for a while okay these they they've never had that okay secondary means that these people little people um have not been bedwetting for a period of a year or more and then they start bedwetting when that happens then we go and we're trying to figure out what is making the aneurysis happen. What has happened, okay? There could be some organic causes that can uh, bring about uresis, all right? There could be some organic causes for that. Some of the organic causes are things like uh, UTIs. Um, these babies who may have type 1 diabetes, um, diabetes, uh, uh, Malignous, diabetes insipidus, uh, the children who may have um, diagnoses of seizure disorders or some obstructed uro, uro, uropathy, all right? Abnormalities that may be noted in their urinal tract or sleeping disorders. So when we are noticing some of this aneurysis that we believe is from an organic cause, then it is for us to figure out what is going on. And then there's things that we can do. There's treatments and there's nursing care plans that must be um, executed when we're figuring out why it's happening and then what we're going to do about it. The first thing that we must do is collect data so that we can understand what's going on and why. And what is the pattern of this? Is there a pattern of their wedding? Um, how many times per night are they doing it? Oh, they're not doing it several times a night? Okay, well then, how many times per week are they doing it? So that we can keep track on how we're getting better or how it is getting worse. The number of daytime voidings that they're having. Also, what is the type of stream that we are noticing? Um, also, we might need to look to see if they have some dysuria. And um, there's some very, you know, simple things that we tell the parents to look out for. You know, pay attention to how much fluid they are taking in between dinner and bedtime. You might have to cut those that fluid hours off for them earlier. Is there a family history of any um, urology problems, okay, or a family history of some enuresis as the children grow up? Is this child under any stress? Stressors can be things like, um, something as severe as people arguing around the child all the time to them starting preschool or, you know, other things that's happening within the family. That can be uh, stressors to the child. Is the child on any medications? Um, are they new medications? Are they changing medications? Um, what are the developmental landmarks? When did they start the potty training? Did they start the potty training um, as an order in, in tone with their developing landmarks. I keep looking over there at the clock, y'all. Okay, so now let's talk about a little bit about preschools, okay? There are some preschool programs. These are very structured activities. They have foster group cooperation and the development of coping skills within preschools. Now, the child does have gains when they go to preschool. They gain self-confidence. They have some positive self-esteem. Um, and this is if they are in a good structured preschool. Not if they're just at some preschool that's just letting them um, watch the iPads and uh, dance to the radio. Not talking about those preschools, okay? I'm talking about structured preschools. There's some good preschool programs that are out there. Now, when I say preschools, let's be 100% honest, and this is a little sidebar. Some of the time, these children can have preschool type activities if they are in a home with a, a loved one or whatever who has a preschool styled um, 
environment for them during the day while they are there. That is very doable. We have seen it. Um, there has been that where you have their, they are, you know, going to the grandmother's house during the day while the parents go to work and the grandmother has a structure. They're going to read, they're going to play, they're going to go to potty on time, they're going to get some outside time, they're going to get some social interactions. That is still preschool activity outside of the preschool. And that child can still gain positive self-esteem and um, within that um, within the confinement of that. But the only thing that they may miss unless they are in another structured program is the ability to have some fostering of good group cooperation and group play but we have seen it where they will be in other things like you know soccer uh basketball t-ball all these kind of things where they are learning this be, these learn they're learning these behaviors all right now let's talk about daily care when it comes to the preschooled child so they uh this does not require extensive physical care but they still need to uh bathe every day learn the importance of bathing every day and shampooing their hair now this thing in this book y'all say shampooing the hair at least twice a week well, let me explain to you that is not for everybody because maybe in the african-american culture we cannot shampoo her hair we can't shampoo this two times a week it, 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 that's that's not how it go so this that is a cultural thought that's right there just want to make that little sidebar okay but I, it's in the book so i had to say it okay now clothing should be loose enough to prevent restriction of movement washability sturdy and supportive shoes for these children now when they're in preschool i understand that it is real cute to make sure that they have the most trendiest shoes on but them little sandals and everything like that may not be the best when they're running and things like that because they can accidentally injure themselves or have a little accident from falling while playing it is very important that they have on proper attire for their age category now you can keep all that little fancy stuff for their pictures and everything i think it's cute i think it's adorable i did it too but i'm just saying for their daily care we need to make sure that their clothes are loose enough to prevent any restriction when they are moving and that it is a washable item and that it is a sturdy and supportive shoe all right those restrictive items can do a few things. It can make it where it's hard for them to go to the potty because then they can't move it up and down, pull it up and down, or things get caught while they're playing. Um, those are some of the problems that we can note with restrictive clothing. Now let's talk about accident prevention. You have to wait. Okay, so let's talk about accident prevention. Accidents are major threats to children between the age of three and five years old. They must have some uh, car seat safety essential steel from three to five years old. Burns do occur because of the child being experimental. Um, poisoning can occur because of an increased freedom and their ex access to get to items that's within their environment. Uh, children should be taught about the dangers of talking to or getting in the car with strangers, uh, talking to strangers, as well as the dangers of playing in uh, secluded areas. They also have accident uh, prone things or we need to teach accident prevention by indirect supervision. This is necessary because of poor judgment. Let's talk about it. So. When they said that they have burns that occur because of child uh, experimentation, they see you moving and shaking and getting things off the stove and moving things like that. They may do the same thing, not understanding that the, something could spill on them or that they can get burned from because they never see it happen to you. So they don't automatically think that it's gonna happen to them. Now, when we talk about poisoning, now here's the thing. It's super important that we make sure that everybody's home that we go to has the same per precautions 
uh, for their, for your children as you do at your home. Because if you leave them somewhere at uh, Auntie Beth's house, and Auntie Beth has all these cleaning products, they have all these pretty colors up under her sink, and they can get into it easily. See, they weren't able to get into it at your house, so they may get into it, and we have some accidental poisoning. Now, let's talk about children being taught about strangers. Here's a side note and a little story time. My oldest daughter has never met a stranger, okay? Uh, never. And when she was growing up and she was a preschooler, it was one of my biggest fears of safety for her. No matter how I tried to teach it, no matter how many times, you know, I taught it to her or explained it to her, um, I had to keep teaching it until she got old enough for it to really, really sink in about strangers, getting into strangers' cars, um, talking to strangers. Uh, that's why I stayed very, very close to her. And it started when she was like three, when I really started getting the fear. Because um, I'm going to tell you the story and you can understand why. She was three years old and well, we were in the military at that time. My husband's retired military. And we were in the commissary, which is the grocery store on base. She's right here with me. I'm getting something or uh, talking to the uh, deli people. So I'm looking at the people at the deli. She's right here. Her little sister is in the um, cart, baby seat. Now, in my brain, she's right here, okay? Because I could feel her next to me. Somewhere along the line, <laughs> there's a lady standing next to me holding my child. And, she's, and when I turn, I see my child in this lady's arms, and I immediately snatch my child from her, and I'm just like, what are you doing? You know, and then she goes, well, I, I was just standing here, and she put her arms up, and I just picked her up. She didn't know that lady from nobody, <laughs> but she didn't understand stranger danger. So at that moment, I learned that even though I was right here, I had to start teaching her not to do it, teaching her strange, strange people interactions, okay? So that's a little story that I tell all of my new moms, you know, and parents who have toddlers about uh, start teaching it when they start getting into their preschool stage. All right. Now let's talk about types of play. There are several different types of play. There is therapeutic, there's play therapy, there's art therapy, and then just overall plain old play. So overall plain old play should be non-competitive. All right. It helps the child adjust to an expanding world and increase independence. So Overall play is not their sport because that's competitive, all right? Then we have therapeutic play, and therapeutic play is something that we're trying to do to help them with therapy of something that's going on. And that play therapy is when the, uh, the therapist may, you know, do a little uh, play activity to see how the child will respond to it or react to it or what they're going to do okay and art therapy is just that a lot of adults need art therapy honey get, get somewhere in color in a coloring book it can soothe your mind all right so i want you guys to pay attention when you're reading your chapter to things like the different types of play in what ways is play important to the physical portion of the child, the psychosocial part of the child, and the emotional development of the preschool child? Please make sure that you guys are paying attention to that and you are understanding what that means. So with that being said, it's question time. It's question time. It's question time. You want question time? Of course you do. Of course you do because, uh, why not? Right? Why not? Let's see here. Oh, we just talked about this. So, let's say that you have a four-year-old child, and the four-year-old child tells you, the nurse, that she will not eat peas because these peas is green. All right? She does not want to eat peas because these peas are green. 
Now, what is this an example of? Is this an example of um, artificialism? Is this an example of centering, how they make everything the same thing? Or is this uh, egocentrism? I need an alarm. Do, 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 do. Time is up. It is them centering. Okay? I told y'all last time about my child who won't eat anything red. All right? Now, let's go on and let's ask a different question. Let's talk about a child um, who is about four years old. And they insist that he has more money with a nickel than with a dime. What is the perception <laughs> as described in the uh, the Piaget's? theory what is they what what are they thinking their part of the theory is intuition they may believe because that nickel is bigger than that dime that it's more money mm -hmm. that's what their intuition is telling them it does not make them correct don't tell her she's not right but it don't make them correct all right that is intuition she is going to argue you down that that nickel is worth more money than that dime. All right? Because her intuition, according to Piggott's theory, is telling her that. All right? Let's keep going. Now, you have... Um, oh, here's a good one. Children who are unable to express themselves with words what do they normally do if a child cannot express themselves with words they normally will do two things they will either act out or they will throw a tantrum simply because their communication is not coming across to you as they want it to or they don't know how to communicate it okay they will not have any introspect they will not develop a method of verbal communication for you right now. They are going to tantrum and they are going to act out because they do not have the words to express what they're trying to say. It is up to us, the adult, the parents, the caregiver in their life to then help them get the words, you know, for, that they want to say to help them with some expression. All right. Now, um, let's go on and talk about um, associative play. Let's give an example of what's not associative play, and then we're going to give an example of what is associative play, okay? Now, an example of what is not is if you have two children who are playing with sports-associated items. Let's just say one is a football and the other is a bat. That is not associative play. But now let's say you have these same two children playing in a house, one playing the role of the dad, the other playing the role of the mom. That is associative play. It, is, it goes together. It's associative play. When they got, one of them got a bat and one of them got a, a basketball, those two things don't go together. That is not associative play. All right, let me see if I want to tell you guys another one. Oh, here's one about their, um, let's talk about their weight and how they grow, okay? So you're at the school nurse and you are assessing the school age child um, with, um, you're assessing their gains, all right? What will you, the nurse, expect to regard as a physical development of the child when you are doing your assessment as the school nurse? Would you expect growth of three to six inches per year? Or would you expect a visual acuity of 20, 20 by nine years old? Or here's the last thing, would you expect for them to gain about five to seven pounds per year? Okay, if your answer was C, guess what? You are correct. You are correct. All right? So, I think that's all I want to 
question y'all on. I know. I know y'all want more questions. Okay? But you need to do that reading and do those objections, objectives. And then you will know it. But I want to give y'all one more good look at our life cast doll. Y'all, she is heavy. Okay. Look at her skin knee. Y'all see that? She has a skin knee. Doesn't that look so real? She has a skin knee. She's been crying. Look at her face. Mm, I'm so upset. I'm so upset. I fell down because my mom did not have me in good sturdy shoes. I didn't have any sturdy shoes. <laughs> Bye, y'all.